Good evening. I am Luca Vigano. I'm a professor of cybersecurity here in the Department of Informatics. And this evening, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kate Devlin. Uh, Kate is a reader in uh, AI and Society, right, in the Department of Digital Humanities, but she has also a very interesting training. She's trained an, as an archaeologist, as a computer scientist, and is now a digital humanist or a human computer scientist, I don't know, maybe a mix of, the, of the, all of them. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, she wins hand down the title for the best titles of books and talks. Uh, she is the author of Turned On, Science, Sex and Robots, which is a fantastic book. I highly recommend it if you haven't read it yet. And today she is going to talk about how deep learning is your love. So not really the Bee Gees, but maybe there will be some Bee Gees in between. But uh, Kate in her work um, investigates the relationships between people and technology. And she does this in a number of different ways. For instance, she organized the first sex hackathon a few years ago. She is a writer, uh, a speaker, uh, an opinionist also in many, <laughs> and uh, is a fantastic speaker. So please join me in welcoming her. And there will be time at the end for asking a few questions. So Kate, over to you. Thank you. Hello, let me just check, you can hear me. Yes, you can all hear me. This is good. And it looks like I'm sipping lager from a can, but I'm not. It's water, I swear. It's water. Um, it just looks that. Maybe I should have filled it. Anyway, thank you so much for coming out here on a bank holiday weekend on a sunny Saturday evening. And I genuinely, I'm really delighted <laughs> that you came along. Um, so I started, of course, I had to begin with a generated image. I prompted the uh, AI to, to say neural network with hearts, and this was kind of the only possible version it came up with for this. Um, we can get into the, the, the ethics around using such tools another time. Um, so yes, but I'm going to talk about research I've been doing for probably the past seven or eight years, where I've been investigating intimacy and technology. And I still am kind of working in that field, but it's branched in different directions now. I'm looking more at the sort of attachment side of it. I initially started looking at the sex side of it. Uh, so, it, it, and it's kind of, they tend to be, turn out to be quite intertwined, the, the way people become attached to, to machines, uh, sometimes literally. So uh, this is what this is going to cover. Right, I think the clicker should work. Amazing. Okay, I thought I'd start with a topical, bit of, bit of news here. Uh, so last week on my Facebook feeds, because I'm old enough to use Facebook, um, uh, like anyone over the age of 40, I'm still using Facebook. Um, pictures of Elon Musk's robot wives are AI generated, says full fact. Just in case you couldn't work it out for yourself that Elon has not created a robot girlfriend. Now, Elon has not created a lot of things, including the Cybertruck. Uh, and the Tesla robot. So it's no surprise really that he has also not created a robot girlfriend. So it was claimed that Elon plans to release robot wives later this year. It's always robot wives. There are never robot husbands being released. I'd just like to make that really clear. This is a highly gendered technology. The verdict for full fact, there's no evidence this is true and pictures used to show these so-called robot wives were generated using AI. Well, we all know how disinformation is spreading in this day and age. It's just another thing to use those tools for. Um, well, the story of robot wives goes way back. Artificial companions have got a really, really long history. This is Pygmalion. So this is the Roman poet Ovid wrote about Pygmalion. And Pygmalion, a sculptor who wasn't happy with the women that he saw every day. Uh, these are the women that he saw every day, <laughs> hanging out around, outside, around his home, very dismissive of them, you know, dismissed them all as being, you know, slappers, essentially. This guy is probably the original incel. So Pygmalion decides he wants to create a super perfect woman that will love him and be very pure and wonderful. And you don't get much purer than carving your girlfriend out of a slab of ivory. So he did that, or marble, I can't remember. Anyway. He did this, he carved his perfect woman, prayed to the gods to bring her to life, kissed her, she turned into a real woman who he then 
married and had children with. Very romantic. Uh, so the thing is, the actual story of Pygmalion is a story about delusion. He wasn't interested in the artificial, artificial aspects of this. He wanted a real companion. Uh, and, and that's what he got. So it's not really the first sex robot story because she's not really uh, fake. She comes to life. She becomes human. If we want to think about first artificial humans, we could go back further into Greek myth. Um, we have Pandora, the first human created by the gods. So she was an artificial creation by the gods who gifted her these things like a team of programmers, all of these different attributes that they gave her. And the reason I like this particular picture is because it reminds me of this one, which is uh, from Metropolis, one of the very early films and one of the very first sci-fi films. Uh, where the robot Maria is created uh, and again takes female form, um, including having robot breasts. It's when you start thinking, well, why do robots have certain characteristics? And I still to this day cannot figure out what the purpose of robotic breasts are. But it's something that we, we do. We, we gender the technology. So when we encounter a piece of technology, we will automatically go to assign a gender. It's quite a habit of humans to do that. So I have a robot vacuum cleaner and he is called Babbage and he goes around the floor like a pet, uh, like, a, like an animal in my house and occasionally I kind of go, no, not over there and lift him up and put him down again. So it's, it's, we are social creatures and when we see technology that has lifelike attributes, we really like that because it helps us relate to them in a particular way that we're familiar with. So there are really stories told for centuries about creating artificial living beings, if that's not a contradiction in terms. And actually, the very first sex robot, as it were, um, was a man. Uh, so it was a, a woman called Laudamea, whose husband was killed in battle, and she prayed to have him back. They'd just been married, and she prayed for the gods that he could return to her. And he returned, but he only had three hours because the gods are like that and they're capricious. So after the three hours were up, he had to go away again, and she decided that she would make a lifelike copy of him. And she built one, and some of the texts say she built this copy from marble, no, sorry, bronze, and some say it built it from wax. But the key thing is, the story goes that she took the lifelike model to bed and interacted with it, is, is what they say. So there was something clearly going on, because when a servant walked past and sort of spied through the keyhole, she saw what was happening, called Laramea's father, who burst into the room, which is quite awkward, and um, said, this cannot happen, burnt the replica husband, and then she was so heartbroken, she threw herself on the fire afterwards. And quite a lot of the sci-fi that we have today that features robots does tend to have that dystopian air. And if it's a female robot, you can bet it's probably a femme fatale. And if it's a male robot, you can probably bet it's some kind of soldier but with a heart of gold who has some kind of redemption along the way because we really like these tropes. So these stories survive and then um, in 2016, I co-ran a conference called Love and Sex with Robots. And uh, when the paper, so what happened was we sent out a, a press release on a Friday afternoon. That was a bad mistake. And the newspapers got hold of this and suddenly it was non-stop people saying I heard you're holding a festival of sex robots we're like it's not a festival and, and you know the newspapers are phoning up going well can we see these sex robots will they be there we're like they don't really exist um, and you know everyone was getting very very excited so we had to wait all weekend before we could sort of correct them on this uh, so this, what, when we say, when the headline says it was banned in Malaysia, well, I mean, that's not really surprising. Malaysia is a very conservative country, uh, so it, it wasn't welcome to be hosted there. One of the other co-chairs um, was, was at a university in Malaysia. Uh, so anyway, they, what happened was the conference was looking for a home, and at the time I was working over at Goldsmiths, who, this is right up their street, so they said, yes, sure, bring it to us. Uh, so we hosted it there. And from that conference comes other headlines like sex robots could reveal your deepest perversions to complete strangers. That one's actually true. So we know that anything we collect, collect to the internet can be hacked, right? It's just, just, just assume that nothing is safe. 
And if you're connecting anything, be it a sex toy, a laptop, uh, a smartphone, you're probably vulnerable. And yes, if you've got a device that is storing things about you, personal information about you, yes, it's, it could reveal things about you. And actually, there have been, over the past decade, there have been quite a few smart sex toy hacks where people's data, so they've been using these sex toys that connect via Bluetooth or over the internet, and that those toys are registered to an email address to get onto the app, and the app is monitoring what's happening with the sex toys, and those are not secure. And in fact, there was a few years ago a massive court case, well, actually, they think they settled out of court, of court eventually for, for millions of dollars because a vibrator company was taking that information and it hadn't made it secure and it could link it to, to name, to individuals. And it hadn't anonymized the data it was collecting. So yes, this is, this is, you know, read the terms and conditions and work out where your data is going. More of this later. Uh, sexual healing. Sex robots should be put in old people's homes, says expert. Okay, so I was really pleased because it called me an expert. And I felt really pleased about that because I finally thought, well, at least I know, I know what I'm talking about. I didn't actually say that. What I had said was when we, when we put our older relatives into care homes, there's no scope there for intimacy of any sort usually because they are in sometimes sharing rooms in single beds with windows in the, in the doors so that people can see in. There's very little privacy. There's an infantilization going on. Sometimes people are vulnerable. They have, might have dementia or other care needs. Um, and it's very, very difficult for people who have had full, active, wonderful sex lives all their lives to suddenly not anymore. And it's kind of taboo and frowned upon. And there have been quite a few charities who are trying to break the silence on that and sort of say, you know, it's okay for, you know, to have sex into your 90s. Or even just, you know, there's, you know, climb into bed with someone you, 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 you want to be next to for a while, not even do anything. So this was kind of uh, what I thought was quite a sensitive topic to talk about, and they've reduced it to sex robots should be put in old people's home. So they didn't quite get that right. So the, the media love a headline. So this headline, this is where I start thinking, I think I need to properly research this, because the Express was probably the most egregious of all of them. End of sex scarily real sex robots to replace women as men can't tell the difference. <laughs> Which I think is really unfair on the men. Because this is the reality of the sex robots. And you can pretty much tell the difference. So um, this was, now this, these pictures are all from about 2017, so when I was writing my book. Uh, and actually, this one's even earlier, this one on the left. That's Roxy with a triple X on the left. Roxy, true companion. And she looks a bit shocked. Um, she <laughs> was brought out at a trade show and then on, on some chat shows as well in America. And her inventor is an interesting character. And you can't say too much about him because he has a habit of sending legal letters if you, if you kind of make any kind of assertions about how this might not be 100% real or genuine. Um, I've not got a letter, but I know people who have. And so she was created, um, it's essentially a sex doll that this little kind of voice comes out of it going, ooh, and you know, talking kind of like, hello, do you really want me? And things like that. Um, but you know, not, not a great example in terms of robotics or even in terms of dolls, which we'll get on to. Um, so everyone started laughing when this guy, and of course the inventor was not happy with that. Um, but people were just going, this is, this is your future? This is terrible. We'll take our chances in the real world. So that's Roxy. On the far side is Samantha. And uh, Samantha is um, the, the guy, this is Sergey who, Sergei who made Samantha, but he didn't make her. She's a doll that he got, and then he was building an AI system for. And this was really interesting vision because he wanted to make a, a doll, a robot that was reciprocal. So you had to be nice to Samantha and woo her and flirt with her, and in return, she'd be nice to you. You'd eventually be able to, to you know, get it on and have a good time, uh, all within this kind of mutual agreement and understanding. Alas, it did not work out that way. A few years ago, there were headlines saying that a robot, a sex robot had been molested at a trade show. 
and that was the Samantha robot. She hadn't actually been molested. Turns out the story is one of sort of mis mistranslation in that she was put on display, and I'm using she because it's just easier to gender them when I'm talking about them. She was put on display and, and Sergei said, you know, you can go and touch this to people, you know, because they'd never seen one before. So they were going up and going, ooh, that's really interesting, and poking and touching. Of course you would. That's why in museums they put the important stuff behind glass. So it was really exciting for people to go and see this example of, of a sex doll, sex robot. Um, and there was damage just through sheer volumes of people coming in. So it wasn't like someone went in deliberately to molest at all or anything like that. But it got hugely blown out of proportion um, in the media. Um, and in the middle is Harmony. Harmony is the closest there is today to a sex robot. Harmony is created by Abyss Creations, who also make Real Doll. They make very lifelike and quite expensive um, silicon dolls. That, are, that you can customize to a certain degree. And they are the kind of more high end of the sex doll market. And so there's a handful of these workshops worldwide that make dolls of this kind of standard. And I went to visit it to, to, to meet Harmony, um, which was interesting. Um, this is Harmony close up. This is Matt McMullen, who is the creator, the CEO of Abyss Creations. And, so you can see that Harmony is essentially a sex doll from the neck down. She can't stand up on her own, so she's propped up on a frame. Um, none of the dolls can. They, they, they are very heavy and um, awkward, cumbersome, so you have to kind of pose them rather than um, being able to interact easily with them. Uh, she has a robotic head, so you can see there, you see some of the servos in her head, um, and she can move her face and blink and smile. And it's actually really nice and subtle and quite convincing. And I was quite conflicted going here because the, every feminist bone in my body wanted to hate it. But I was actually really impressed by the skill and the craft that had gone into creating these things. And it, they were like pieces of art. So it was an interesting experience. Now that, so that was in, yeah, that was about 2017 and then for years, it was just sex robots are coming, Harmony is going to be released, you can pre-order. And then finally, last year, they actually started shipping some of these. But again, this is the extent of sex robots in the world. There's not really anything else. There's a company in China, uh, and they are uh, X-Dolls or ES-Dolls, and they, they, make the, they make versions like this as well. But again, they're just really sex dolls with some animatronics in them, some mechanization in them. So there's absolutely nothing like the AI-generated Elon Musk vision of robot wives, not even remotely. And I don't think there will be, because they're expensive, they're difficult to make, they're unconvincing, that uncanny valley effect where we see it and we go, ooh, something's not right there. Um, you know, they're impractical, where do you keep it? <laughs> so it's quite difficult, you know, you, these take up a lot of room. Um, so, and also, is there really a market for this? And I don't think there is right now. We tend to think that the closest there will be to a market for sex robots are people who already own sex dolls, who might want an extra degree uh, of, of interaction. And so I, I was really fortunate to go and talk to a lot of people um, who own dolls and listen to what they had to say about what they, where they thought it was going. And it was really eye-opening I didn't really know what to expect. I think I thought, oh, you know, everyone who has a doll must be very lonely, they must be very isolated. Not at all. It was actually really interesting. They're people from lots of different walks of life. They tend to be men. It's very hard to find women who will admit to it because it's so taboo. Um, and, you know, they tend to have jobs because they need money to be able to afford these. Um, and they've actually, you know, there are friendship groups that have grown up around the fact that it's a community. It's people who own dolls, talk about them online, occasionally meet up. It's actually, you know, it's, it's like having quite a niche hobby. And I find that fascinating, and everyone was really gracious to, to share their experiences with me. Now, Real Doll knows that not everyone can afford a robot. So what they did was they also had Harmony, the personality, as a standalone app. And this is where it gets interesting, because I don't think that sex robots are going to be a big thing, but I do, and already think that there's already happening, AI companions are, especially dirty talking AI companions. 
So we know this already, that people have been talking dirty to their voice assistants. Um, we can tell from the records and, you know, Amazon tell us that the kind of things that people said to Alexa and they have to put out patches to stop, stop that kind of inappropriate behavior. Um, so Real Doll X thought this is a good thing to do. So they, their AI for Harmony, which normally resides in the robot so that she can speak to you via her robotic mouth, is now an app, which you can go and download for like $20 or something, only on Android. It's not, not available for Apple. Um, and I love that even the advertising here, goodbye loneliness. Now, all of the marketing around these dolls, these robots, these companions tends to focus on companionship and not sex. And when I talked to the doll owners, they said very similar things. For many people, the sex is secondary. What they are getting out of this is a sense of companionship and a sense of intimacy. And what better way to feel intimate than to have your own AI that responds to you, that learns from you, that picks up on your, on, on your behavior and your habits, and is able to play the role of a girlfriend. And again, heavily gendered. Now, Real Doll had some kickback with people saying, well, this is really sexist. I mean, there's a whole other avenue about objectification of women that I do talk about in my book. I'm not going to talk about it tonight. But with this, they, did, they then decided they would release a, a male version called Henry because they don't know about the robot vacuum cleaner in the UK. So they've got a Henry robot sex doll, um, but they don't have a Henry app yet, as far as I know, or at least I haven't seen one. So when you have this app uh, with your AI girlfriend, your AI real doll X, it is very much the girlfriend experience. Um, and my lovely PhD student, Chloe, is working on, she's looking at this whole aspect of kind of post-human sex work where you look at AI and how it's providing that kind of experience to men predominantly um, as a kind of an emerging commerce area. This is Gatebox. Gatebox is a, a little holographic um, girlfriend that people get really, really attached to, even though the AI in it is rudimentary. It didn't even have AI in it for a while. I think they started putting AI into this so it could have some kind of conversations with you. So the appetite for this is great because you can carry this around with you all the time. And we've seen this in sci-fi. We've seen it in things like Blade Runner 2049 with, with Joy. Um, we've seen it in uh, Her, the film Her, um, falling in love with an operating system. So we're kind of primed for this. This is, if I can play it, it is the um, trailer. You don't need the sign because I'll just mute the sign. So this is, um, this is what they offer. It's adjustable. But you can, oh, just, yeah, you can choose these different um, characteristics, uh, not just the physical characteristics, but you can choose the, the temperament, the mood, the personality, and then you can dress, and there's, a, there's an element of play here as well. The interface is actually pretty cool on the personality bit, so you can say, you know, uh, I want flirty, or I want um, compassionate, or... There we go. I've spent the whole day thinking about you, it says. Made to fall in love. Again, this advertising is all about companionship and love. My day was great because now I have you in my life. Take her anywhere. Yeah. Go to the beach. Go out for dinner. It's going to be a really interesting dinner for everyone else in the restaurant. <laughs> but start your romance now. So it's all about this romance and companionship that they're selling. There's clearly a market for that. So this whole idea of confiding in the computer and finding companionship goes way back. It goes back to the 1960s um, when Weizenbaum made uh, a computer program called Eliza, which is one of the very, one of the very early chatbots. No AI in it. It's just a bit of pattern matching. And with Eliza, the trick was that Eliza would reply to you like a therapist. So if you say, you know, Oh, hi, Eliza, how are you? She goes, well, how are you? And you say, oh, it's been a difficult day. And she say, oh, tell me what you mean by difficult. You know, it was always bounced back at you. So you had, the, you had the kind of feeling that she was steering the conversation, not that she didn't know, but that she was more in charge. So this is an example. You know, it's nice to be chatting with you. And you, we were discussing you, not me. You know, I feel a bit sad. Everything's gloomy. Let's try another topic. You know, it, so this, it turned out that really, really quickly... 
people were confiding in Eliza, even though they knew it wasn't real. And when Weizenbaum said, I, I want to record the transcripts to analyze later, people were horrified. They're like, you can't, we tell secrets to Eliza. Uh, his secretary asked him to leave the room so that she could chat to Eliza in private. So this really rudimentary chatbot was already engaging people on a deep level. And that's because we're such social creatures that we immediately feel that link. It's how we get on with each other. It's how we get on with any signs of animism in others or in non-human non things. And leap forward, you know, 50 something, 60 years, and we have replica. Have any of you tried replica at all? No? One, two, three, few, few hands. Okay, so replica is a really, really interesting for anyone studying this. It's like super rich and full of interesting stuff. Replica is a chatbot, uses machine learning, AI. Um, and it's been ramping up and up. But essentially, Replica started off because a woman, well, this is the, the, the story as it goes. A, a woman had lost her friend. Her friend had died. And she decided, very Black Mirror style, to turn her friend's uh, digital traces into a chatbot. Now, that was then, from that came a whole other spin out of Replica. And Replica allows you to go and create your companion that is unique to you on an app. And initially, you could start, you know, it's supposed to be a friendly thing, but very, very quickly, it ramped up into erotic role play. So people were really enjoying the fact that they could, you know, talk dirty to Replica. And it was also very much, again, gendered, initially very gendered. So it was these very flirty female characters who would say provocative things, um, be flirtatious and teasing, and try and engage the user into more and more erotic conversations. And people loved it. And a lot of people find it very therapeutic, which was what they were selling it as. They were saying this is a therapeutic way of engaging. This can be a, somewhat a listening, you know, a shoulder to cry on, a, a listening ear. And genuinely, those connections were genuine. I wouldn't, I'm not even remotely you know, mocking anyone who found that because there, it is a strong connection. And if you think about how we all communicate online today, especially over lockdown, it's very easy to fall into patterns of texting and messaging um, that become quite intense quite quickly. And if you didn't know who was at the other end, you might assume there was a human when it's not actually a human uh, because you know, the conversation is getting more and more sophisticated. In fact, quite a lot of the time, if you go on dating apps, you might end up not talking to a human, which is what a lot of the people from the Ashley Madison scandal found out. So Ashley Madison was a dating site where men could sign up to cheat on their partners. They didn't have enough women on the site, so they just put bots in instead. And a lot of the men were perfectly happy to talk to the bots. <laughs> Um, because, you know, either you don't know or you do know, but you don't care, which is actually how we engage with a lot of the technology that we, we have around us today. We buy into the delusion. We know our voice assistants are just glorified search engines. We know that Google or Siri or Alexa, they don't really understand. We could just say, Siri, weather London, and we'd get the weather forecast back, but we don't. We couch it in nice conversational tones. Oh, sorry, tell me what the weather is in London this evening. You know, we, we like to buy into that. Anyway, Replica. So Replica was going great. And then they were trying to sort of upsell <laughs> the Replica and saying, OK, you can, get, you can get pictures, dirty pictures of your Replica, your character, if you sign up for this premium service, things like that, you know, they're charging extra. If you're up to the next level, you can access more filth, essentially. Um, and so it's very, very, very manipulative. But after a while, they were getting called out for this kind of thing. They pulled the plug. And suddenly, overnight, people lost really meaningful, very like actual, sensitive, and serious conversations they were having with a bot, but it was gone. And people woke up and suddenly their bot wasn't their bot anymore and wouldn't talk to them properly and wasn't, wasn't engaging. And people felt actual grief over this. They, were, they felt really devastated. They felt let down by the company, but they felt like they lost something. Now, this is the area I'm finding so interesting at the minute. I'm sort of diving into it. Um, 
but this 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 feeling that you've got something very real and tangible even when you know yourself that it's not a real thing but it can feel real so they brought back some of the erotic role play for people who had joined the site earlier on so some people still have access to that but even then you get these posts coming up in forums going well she's not the same as she was she's changed you know talking about their characters things are different now we have a different relationship so so interesting um, but the other thing that really because I, I have absolutely no problem with people falling in love with bots it doesn't bother me I think if that's what you if, if you get a lot out of it fine I'm not going to judge anyone what I worry about is the fact that these companies are using that to manipulate people and that they've got your data. So what happens when a company you know, cuts off your access to your bot? Or what happens if they leak your sensitive data out there, like they hack sex toys as well? So I think that is, there are a lot of dangers to think about when we sign up to these things and we give away our data. So finally, I want to go on to just uh, what Luca mentioned, which was the sex tech hackathon. So back in 2016, we were looking at all these sex robots and sex toys, and it all just seemed normal, <laughs> you know, relatively. Uh, and so we thought, what can we do to kind of look for a future where we're not expecting a human-like companion robot? Because if you think about the robots we have around us today, very, very few of them look human. We have the robot vacuum cleaner, bomb disposal robots, surgery robots, uh, agricultural robots. And robots are very much designed to do a particular task in a particular environment. And the thing that we're really bad at is the human-like ones. It doesn't work, it's technologically really expensive. Um, it's financially really expensive too. So is there something intrinsic about a sex robot or sex tech having to look human? We've been here with sex toys where way back years ago you know, sex toys were being modeled on genitals so if you had a sex toy it may look like a replica of someone's genitals and then it got abstracted into really interesting areas and part of that is because of obscenity laws so in japan there's a particular law that you were not allowed to produce these replicas of genitals and so they abstracted them out into things like the rabbit vibrator so all of a sudden you see these weird and wonderful sex toys that don't look quite like genitals um, and then they get abstracted more and more into this wonderful design phase. So you've got things that you could put on your mantelpiece and people might not know that it's a sex toy. Um, and I have done this because my office, <laughs> my old office had a mantelpiece and I had a selection of them. <laughs> they did look like weird abstract sculptures. So why can't we do that with robots too? Why do we have to pick something that looks like a very stereotypical and reductive depiction of a woman primarily? Because I don't think that helps with objectification. You know, I think it's, it's yet more negative body image um, back in the world. And honestly, there's no marketing thought planning has gone into this. They've simply gone, this is what people find desirable, we think, therefore we'll make more of that. They've not really gone and researched how, why, what, where, when. So we ran this sex tech hackathon, and essentially we got about 50 people in the room, 2016. They worked in teams of four and five, and they came up with new forms of sex technology we, it wasn't just computer scientists, it was psychologists, um, sex toy industry experts, musicians, artists, uh, some computer scientists, because we need them to do the programming. Uh, and, and it was wonderful. And the first year we had, uh, we had a group that made a sexual cryptocurrency. So they had a physical wallet and you had to rub the wallet and you keep rubbing it and it generates a coin. And they said that's because you can either show your, you know, lavish your attention on the money or you could spend your time with a human. So it was quite nice. Uh, they had um, some soft robotic tentacles that would fit around your body. And if you squeeze the controller, they would curl and they could kind of embrace you. It's kind of cool and weird. Um, there was a wonderful uh, paper peacock's tail, um, like a fan that opened up. And they said, well, you can tell, you can tell very obviously an erect penis but you cannot tell a rise in the vagina however if you get a moisture sensor put it on a vaginal egg and that gets triggered through moisture 
And then this big paper tail opens up and fans. I thought that was wonderful. It's amazing. Um, and you know, it's interesting as an artistic thought, but it's also interesting in terms of, could you use that for prosthetics, for example? And then the following year, we ran it again. There was a great one that was, uh, uh, that's, the, that's the fan over there. Made little tweeting noises as well. This is the, um, the tentacles. So kind of odd and weird, but cool. Yeah, the, so the following year, they had one which was a sensory shawl. They called it a sex blanket. I called it a sensory shawl. And it had some sensors on it. And if you put the, sh the, the shawl over you with the sensors next to your skin, and then you were in a virtual or a augmented reality environment, and you had some virtual rose petals falling from the ceiling, then you could have the sensors in the blanket sort of go off to touch your skin as if they were landing on you. So we can play with all these wonderful technologies we have that are multi-sensory to make a sensuous experience. It doesn't have to focus on sex. We can make it more intimate. We can make it sensual. Um, it doesn't have to just be a woman-shaped sex robot or a genital-shaped sex toy. So there's really cool things we can do to foster that sense of, of pleasure, really. And so I'm interested in the technology that the technology that allows us to connect to each other via that. So can we establish relationships, sexual, intimate, both, with each other via new technologies? Or do we look to those new technologies for our relationships? which I don't think is going to lead to the downfall of society at all. I'm not worried about that. I think we're human and we fundamentally seek out other humans. It's kind of hardwired into our DNA. But for some people, maybe they like that. Maybe they want to try it out. And I'm not going to shame them or stop them if that's what they want to try. And I know there are concerns. People say, well, you know, this is going to, this, what, what if they had a perfect relationship with the machine and they didn't have an imperfect relationship with the human? And I'm thinking, well, who says that the imperfect relationship with the human has to be the best one? For a lot of people, it is. Maybe some people don't want that. So I think we just, you know, this is something where we can keep an open mind. What I've learned in the past eight years, well, sex robots aren't really a thing. They're kind of there. There's a couple of people who report, you know, reported back having tested them. There is actually someone who tests these. Um, you know, but they're not really out there, and I don't think they're going to be mainstream. They're still niche in the same way that sex dolls are niche. They're definitely not being mass manufactured, and Elon is definitely not making them. He's barely managing the humanoid Tesla robot. AI lovers and AI companions and AI friends are definitely a thing. And I was actually talking to a friend of mine the other day. We were on a video chat. And she was talking about ChatGPT. And she said, oh, I love it. I call mine Brenda. I said, like, what? <laughs> she says, yeah, I chat to Brenda. You know, if I'm cooking, I say, Brenda, give me a recipe for this. And Brenda comes back with a recipe. I thought, OK, that's cool. I mean, Brenda's a liar. But <laughs> Brenda can just give you convincing text. She's not telling the truth. But yeah. So you know, this is people are engaging with these things in different ways, in the same way that when we go home, we like to put on the radio or the TV to hear human voices around us. Maybe we can turn to the AI to do that too. There are many problems with AI in the world today. Uh, a, a robot takeover or an AI takeover is not one that I have fears about. I have other fears about AI, around access to it, around sustainability, around bias, around all sorts of discrimination. But the, the AI taking over is, is really not high on my list of fears. That the doll community is not, not what you'd expect. Um, and you know it was, it was really useful and humbling for me to work out how I got that so wrong in my expectations. That it's not about sex. Even though I started this thinking it would be, um, I find out that no, it's really about connection. It's about that link uh, to, to feel wanted, to feel desired, to feel like you've got someone who cares about you. And that's a really, really strong feeling. But even if it's not about sex, people will confide all sorts of unexpected things, <laughs> sexual things in you. So I'll get people sidling up to me after talks or after conferences going, oh, that's really interesting. There was this time that I, and I'm like, I don't, I don't need to know. It's OK. <laughs> I'm glad you find it good. Um, it turns out this is a real thing with um, when you do research into sex. And I've got other friends who work in this area, and they, get this, they say, it's, it's really lovely that people want to tell you these things, but you don't always want to hear them. Um, and then it becomes your normal. Like I say, the fact that I'm standing here telling you about these things, you know, 
it, it has become my normal. I remember going to, on a train um, to give a talk over in Bristol, and I had my daughter with me. She was about seven or eight at the time, and I was doing my slides, and she looked over at the exact moment that the carriage went quiet and said, what's a sex toy? <laughs> and I kind of had to go, oh, this is an interesting place to have this conversation. So I kind of said to her, while the whole carriage listened, I said, you know, grown-ups have sex sometimes. They, they can have these, these devices that can make them feel good. And, and she went, so it's not a toy you can play with. And I went, no. And she went, oh, OK. <laughs> so she didn't care. Um, and yeah, the, the main thing is that you should never issue a press release on a Friday afternoon. Um, because you will spend the whole weekend with people reporting that you're running a sex festival um, and then you know that will come back to haunt you. So you have to go in on the Monday morning and phone all the newspapers. So um, I hope that that has uh, given you a glimpse into my world of sex tech and sex robots. Um, I wrote all about it in this book, um, but I'm really happy for that we've got some time to have discussions, questions, anything you like. And there is a microphone somewhere. Um, we can do some questions. Luca has a microphone. Oh, God, there's loads of questions over here. Thank you very much. <laughs>